my furthest traceable Rimson ancestor who was baptized by Juan Crespi in our Carmel Valley village of Tukutnut in January of 1773. I think I need to click here on the, this is being recorded message. Okay. So I mentioned this um, because she was only the 32nd person to be baptized at Mission San Carlos down here in Carmel giving you an idea how early our families were physically, socially, and culturally impacted by the Catholic Church and Spanish colonization. I think it was growing up knowing of my heritage, but not the culture that led to a burning desire to find what was lost. And I've spent the past 35 years working on that. Um, though it's not directly related to archeology, span I'd like to start with basketry. Um, because there's a reason for that. And um, in part, it is a request from Rob Edwards. Oh dear. For some reason, uh, hmm. Um, Sim, I need to let you know that for some reason, um, my- Try slide. closing the- um file and then re resharing the powerpoint really okay should i sh should i stop share i think yeah. something happened when um i had to click out of the um permission to record all right so i'm going to stop sharing correct yes okay. and then start over from where you are resharing re Perfect. All right. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, then. So um, I was about 35 years old when a random encounter with this poster printed by, as uh, you can't really see it, it's in the fine print at the bottom, by the dun -dun -dun, Santa Cruz County Archaeological Society, I see your name has changed a little, got me started on my quest to find Ohlone baskets, which in turn allowed me to begin making them. I had previously read what anthropologist Alfred Krober had written that all of our baskets had perished, none remained in the world. But this basket, I mean, sorry, this poster contradicted that statement and taught me that there were indeed a few of our old baskets still remaining. So I set out to find them and then began making them myself. Of course, this happened step by step over a long period of time. Little story. Uh, the first time I spotted this poster was at Coyote Hills Regional Park in Fremont. My son, who's almost 39 now, was only, a, I think, about a year and a half old uh, at the time. So this is, would make it about late 1984. I lived in Milpitas at the time and went bicycle riding at Coyote Hills one day um, with my son on the back of my bike. We stopped in at the visitor center and while walking around, I noticed this poster on the wall of the park naturalist's office. Well, I asked if I could uh, like maybe see it up a little closer. And um, I found myself puzzling through the process of trying to figure out whose baskets these really were because it, um, I mean, the speaker, Larry Dawson's name was like gigantic. And the word basketry was about just about as big. And then the next line, quote unquote, of the local Native Americans uh, was getting kind of small. And my brain immediately pounced on local. Local to what? What is, I mean, what does that mean? So I scanned down a couple more lines to the really fine print, seeing that the talk had taken place in Santa Cruz a few years earlier. Santa Cruz, I thought. Does this mean that there are Ohlone baskets? Could this really be true? So the naturalist working that day was very kind. And even when I asked if it might be possible to photocopy the poster. So we copied it in sections. And when I got home, I cut out the baskets and organized them into a binder. And then the following days, I looked up the addresses of um, the various museums, which wasn't really all that easy back then before Google. And, um, and then that was my beginning. So monetarily, and as the mother of a young child, 
I couldn't really visit any but the more local baskets. But um, I looked at the poster on my wall a couple of days ago, and it was fun to see that since then I visited all, all of these baskets except for um, the second from the top on the right, which is in a private collection. And, um, and then actually the top center basket which um, is supposed to be at the Smithsonian doesn't really match what's at the Smithsonian. So there's something a little off there. But the one that is at the Smithsonian, I have seen on um, two different uh, visits. Anyway, um, I kind of wanted to mention just while we're here, like uh, num the number one top left, just to kind of give you a sense of things, probably is not Ohlone at all. Um, though a note associated with it kind of gave the impression that it was from Santa Cruz. Um, truthfully, some of the other baskets on this poster may not be Ohlone either, um, but the point is this is what got me started. And the other point is people learn things, you know, as time goes by, so um, our interpretation of things can change. And that's what's happened in, in with the case of um, baskets. And so some baskets that have been assumed and identified as Ohlone may in fact be Coast Miwok. And there are a couple people around who um, I would consider uh, to be fairly uh, reliable sources on that, namely uh, Margaret, Margaret Mathewson. In any case, there are only about 20 or 25 old Ohlone baskets remaining in the world. And over the past 35 years, I made 24 new ones, which has basically doubled that number. And it all started with this poster. So thank, thank you very much, Rob Edwards. You were, um, and I don't know who else was part of it back then. Anyway, I thought I'd share a few uh, basketry related photos, um, but I really truly am trying not to linger too long on these so we can get to the arc related stuff. Anyway, so <clears throat> this one, um, in order to begin making baskets myself, I needed to study some of those old ones to see how they were made, what materials, and really scrutinize a whole lot of technical details. Here I was examining two relevant baskets from the Caibranli Museum in Paris, measuring and photographing and taking lots and lots of notes. On the same trip to Europe, I also visited the British Museum to examine one basket in particular, but staff um, also kindly pulled out lots of cultural materials collected by Vancouver along the California coast, including Monterey around 1790. And it was truly wonderful to see these things. Um, there was a net bag, a basketry ear ornament, which you'll see a little bit in a couple minutes here, abalone bracelets, feather headpieces, bows, arrows. I mean, it was really an experience. So jumping ahead here. So um, once I kind of got to see what our baskets were like and know what I was aiming for, looking at technical details, um, I needed to learn how to harvest and process and prepare the plant materials for weaving. So in this picture here, I have an armload of sandbar willow, the species needed to make our baskets. And for those who may not know, only straight shoots will work. So it's not necessarily easy to find what we need. I know we all know that willows abound, right? But the species that basket weavers need, um, at least in this area, is absolutely not the prevalent species. And I have a very hard time finding them. But in this picture, you know, thanks to my friend Vera Powers, who's Mutsen Ohlone, um, she spotted these not far from where she lives in Hollister. And we were able to harvest quite a lot for a few short years before the willows were no longer available. Finding a good source of quality willows um, of the right species and within a reasonable distance of home is still a problem for me. Um, each stick has to be peeled. Just trying to give you a little sense of the labor involved here um, to remove the bark, then dried for several months. One day's harvest, I mean, which would be 
more than this arm load because sometimes I fill up kind of the back seat of my car or something, depending what's available. But it can take several days to strip the bark. And um, as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of time and labor involved just to harvest and process the materials before the also labor intensive weaving can ever begin. Another important weaving material is white root sedge, which has to be dug from the ground since it's the underground runners or rhizomes that um, we use. The rhizomes have to be split and the bark peeled off, dried for six months or more before they're ready to use. And then there's much more work to be done because they have to be sometimes split again and scraped clean. Really a picky business. Oh, shoot. For some reason, Well, something happened here. Okay, it's working again. All right. So I spent months and months searching for the native plants I'd need for weaving and eventually was able to make this. My first little basket, first little traditional basket completed in 1994 and roughly 10 years after I first saw that poster. Eventually, I got really good at making our baskets and added a new one basically every year or two seems to have averaged out in between raising a child and working and tending to life. This is the same basket um, that was in the foreground, I believe, in the previous slide, um, just a different view. So in 2009, which turns out to be about 15 years after completing that first little basket, I found myself confronting the exciting but scary challenge of making not one, but two good sized feathered and olive vela beaded baskets, a type that hadn't been made in roughly 250 years. Um, the pattern on the outer surface is a combination of olive vela disc beads, no stranger to any of the California archaeologist here. And in this case, chicken feathers that I dyed red basically to simulate the acorn woodpecker feathers um, that had been used in the past, but um, would be basically impossible for me to get in great numbers and against the law besides. So, um, oh, this kind of reminds me, I wanted to mention that this basket and a couple of other items I believe that I'll be showing tonight are on exhibit at the University of San Francisco's Thatcher Gallery. Um, the, the exhibit just opened, I believe last week. And let me look, it uh, runs through November 7th. The exhibit title is All That You Touch, Art and Ecology. Just in case you might be or live in the Bay Area and wanna check it out. Boy, I don't know why my slides are, okay, I guess I have to do it this way now. About the same time I learned I'd been selected for the Creative Work Fund grant, the Oakland Museum commissioned me to make a similar basket. <clears throat> it took three years to complete these two baskets, the one you just saw, let's see if it'll go backwards, and this one, uh, working fairly full time. And, you know, just to, Full disclosure, I was working on both baskets concurrently. Um, I'm not sure if it would take me that long these days, maybe not because I was having to learn a lot of things and figure out a lot of things and basically reverse engineering a lot. Um, but primarily um, I needed to make more than 2000 olive oil beads and weave them into the stitches of the basket as I wove. So um, it was a bit challenging in the beginning, um, figuring out you know, how to make those beads to start with and then figuring out how to avoid breaking them after all that work when, as I was weaving, because you have to flip them upwards as you're weaving the stitches in that 
spot from the row below, but then, well, when you insert them in the weaving, but then you have to flip the beads back down. And so the tension of the stitch um, is just something that I had to adjust. And, um, but in the beginning, after all that work, I would end up breaking the beads. All right, so let's talk Olivella beads for a bit here. Um, the first step was, of course, to find and gather the Olivella shells at low tide. So that was the easy part. Then from ethnographic sources and from Craig Bates, who with his wife, uh, Sheila Deeg, are in the audience, I know because I saw their little picture in the beginning. Um, so Craig Bates, a good friend and longtime curator at the Yosemite Museum. From Craig, I learned that the shells have to be heated, which uh, both whitens them and I learned from experience over the years also changes the texture of the shell material, making it less brittle. At the time, Craig was teaching me to make an Olivella dance rope made of, um, I guess you call them locked um, whole shell beads. But the experience of heating the shells came in handy later when it came time to make the little disc beads for my basket. From what I've read, it seems that at least in some places, shells were heated in hot ashes, which was not a convenient method for, for me, because um, I'm not a fire making person. Um, but I had remembered learning through my work with the John P. Harrington field notes that um, some larger seeds were once cooked in our roasting basket by flipping them in the basket with hot sand. So it sounded like a good plan to me. And um, it's, you know, for myself, it's proven to work really well over the years. But what about actually making the beads? So I had seen a lot of olive vela beads when working with archaeological collections over the years and had seen them in plenty of arc reports as well. But now that it was time to make them myself, what did I need to know? Well, I thought, let's get out the Benihoff book. Uh, so I'd like to be able to say that it enlightened me, but unfortunately, and to my surprise, really, I only got more confused by all the analysis. And um, really, I was wondering, uh, and I felt like such a simpleton, but I was wondering, well, can I like seriously choose exactly what place on the wall of each shell to make a bead from? and then managed to not break that part of the shell <laughs> when, while I was trying to separate it from the rest. So uh, maybe just uh, ignorant of the true processes of the past, but in the end, to be frank, I just kind of got tired of spinning my wheels and looking at books and decided to just break the damn shells with a hammer stone <laughs> and then just see what random pieces you know, I got and go with, go with what was there and, you know, take it away. So uh, I was kind of chuckling last night thinking about, well, I wonder if somebody like typed my beads on my basket, they'd probably like be all over the charts or something, um, falling into a number of categories. And, you know, that's why. Uh -huh. But that's the way it goes. I was just really trying to make two beautiful baskets um, with the Olivella beads. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping I'll learn more about it in the future. But if not, you know, whatever, the baskets are there, the beads look beautiful on them. But I did learn some anecdotal things in the several months I was that I spent making more than 2000 beads. And in case anybody is interested, um, thought I'd kind of mention these kind of two probably most basic things. Number one is that all of Alibipucata shells love to fracture. And I believe that they're fracturing along their growth lines, which if you're looking at the shell, you know, like tip to kind of tip to end, um, then they would be vertical. And um, the cooking, um, heating them, helps mitigate this a little bit um, because it makes the shell softer and a little bit chalky. 
but there's still a pretty high rate of breakage, uh, especially during drilling. Number two, I noticed over time that there are only a couple of places on the wall of the shell that tend to have the structural integrity um, to withstand the bead making process and also have no chamber wall you know, on the interior side. So in other words, on a little olivella snail shell, there are actually very limited opportunities for a disc bead that's smooth on both the concave and convex sides. Practical person that I am, I assumed it was the material that dictated the locations from which the shells were made in the past, not just um, like preferences. But since I'm somewhat ignorant about the results of broad of olivella bead analysis, I'm probably at least partially wrong about that. And um, if there's anybody that I, archeologists out there that I know personally, and you wanna enlighten me in the future, um, I would welcome that. But let me show you an olivella shell that might blow your mind, like it did for Jackie Keel, um, who's Mutsun Ohlone, a good friend who uh, is here this evening with us. Um, Jackie and I uh, were blown away when we were photo documenting a large number of items from San Mateo 125, Philoli Gardens in um, 2008, prior to their reburial. I just could not believe it when I saw this olive shell here. <laughs> And I don't know how common or uncommon this is for archaeologists to run across, but it's the only time that Jackie or I had ever seen anything like it in basically several combined decades of experience with the Loney area artifacts. And this is probably contradicts what I just explained was my um, perspective on Let's just give the shells a whack. Um, because clearly, in this case, the person did not give the shell a whack. They somehow incised this rectangular piece right out of the shell wall. Now, I don't know if, uh, let me back up and say that in putting this together for this evening, I did look at all of the images that I had of the items that we photographed. And in those photos, I did not see a single disc, you know, disc shaped um, olivella bead, only these uh, rectangular ones. And for me, it's hard for me to picture or imagine that it would be as um, successful to incise in kind of a curvilinear, you know, uh, line and shaping. But I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, but in any case, for me at least, it really kind of blew away my typical preconceived notion. You know, it all went out the window which I thought was a good thing. I like that. Anyway, back to the little me doing my best to make more than 2000 olivella beads. I experimented and just kept plugging along, learning along the way and trying new things as they occurred to me. Um, basically trying to improve my production techniques and reduce the amount of loss due to breakage. As in all things, I got better and more efficient over time. But even with the use of modern tools, I estimated that each bead represented about 15 minutes of labor, labor time. And um, by the way, I tried shaping the outer edges. I know, you know, some along the way, there were people who said, <clears throat> and believe me, I thought of this myself, was to load the shells up in, um, like a string of them and grind them all together like you do clamshell beads. But what happened for me at least was kind of the extreme curvature of the olivella shells really resulted in a, a really uneven edge because they're not like this. So when you grind the edge, 
you're getting um, basically a, a perpendicular kind of angle, but because of the really extreme curvature, when you do it like that, you're getting this um, really uneven um, angled edge. And I just couldn't accept that. So um, in the end, I, I ended up just doing the edges. I ended up shaping each bead one at a time. Okay, so now I'd like to move to something different, but still related to basketry. When this hopper mortar was given to me many years ago, I was immediately excited by the heavy ring of asphaltum because that was clear evidence that we had had a hopper basket. I vowed one day I would make a basket to sit on top of the mortar again, um, like one had obviously done so many years ago. And it, as you can see, it was held in place by this thick uh, ring of asphaltum. And then later during my work with our language, I found the name for this basket, which is a pechump tiprin and translates stuck on basket. You know what? I just glanced at my clock and I can't believe how much time I've taken already. So um, I'm going to skip um, my explanation for what this basket's used for. If anybody really wants to know, maybe you can ask, but we're going to end up. <laughs> I think there's plenty of time. Are you sure? Yeah. All right. I'm basically halfway through, but many of the slides don't have so much to say about them. Well, then I will explain real quickly. So the purpose of this bottomless basket is to create a deep bowl from a shallow mortar depression so that acorn fragments will hit the walls and then fall back down into the bowl for further pounding. I know the archaeologists present probably know about this, but other people may not. Anyway, so a few years later, I finally kept my promise and made my first one. And a couple of years ago, I made two others. Uh, one's at the De Sassé Museum on Santa Clara University campus, in case anybody is around and wants to take a look. And the other um, I made for the Sanchez Adobe's Interpretive Center, which is pretty darn new um, in Pacifica, which is San Mateo County. There we go. So here you can see the completed basket, first one sitting on the mortar from Tukutnuk. And um, you can see how it was used. The basket is, uh, oh, this black basket is also on display in the USF um, Thatcher Gallery exhibit, All That You Touch, Art and Ecology. Um, and I wanted to mention that if you're interested, um, the virtual opening celebration is tomorrow late afternoon, uh, let me look, 5 to 6.30. And um, if you wanted, uh, they'll be introducing all of the artists during that and kind of a little virtual gallery tour. I'm sure you can find the log on information on their website. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I wanted to say that this hopper basket for me serves as an example of the connections that we who are from these communities of the past still have today and how they can inspire us and basically live again by being used by us. And then I'm throwing out a plea, a personal plea. Um, and I guess the caption on here explains it, but you know, I'm quite certain that our um, hopper baskets from here, Monterey area were, would have been twined. Uh, it would be weird if they were not but some California hopper baskets are coiled. And it occurred to me long ago that there could be some evidence to help resolve that question in the impressions in the asphaltum that's on the rim. I, I guess it says up there, I, I really have scrutinized it with my very nearsighted eyes and um, so they're kind of like built-in magnifying glasses and I really don't see anything. There are a couple of little, you know, dips, but not enough repetitions. But if anybody should know of any kind of technology, um, you know, I just would um, beg you <laughs> to um, let me know sometime. 
So to the steatite, um, kind of the tar asphaltum subject brings me to these, um, which were in the promotional materials for this talk tonight. And I wanted to kind of tell you the story of how I came to make them. Um, and it came through piecing together information from three separate archeological finds. So it start, all started out with seeing photos of this uh, steatite piece from our village of Eshelot in Carmel Valley in a Gary Bruschini Trudy Haversat report. I really didn't notice at the time the reference to there being tar residue on one end. It's a very small amount, but I assume if you're looking at it, and I'm pointing it out to you that you'll notice it in the piece on the left. But about three years ago, I think it was, um, I did notice that comment and um, <clears throat> it really caught my attention and I got in touch with Gary to talk about it. I was really fascinated by the possible meaning of the tar being there. And he mentioned an abalone disc from Carmel Highlands, uh, quite a you know, number of miles away that has a heavy, heavy application of asphaltum on the backside. And boom, like I suddenly was super excited. And these two things strongly suggested that the tar residue on the steatite spool once had held something decorative in place, right? So there was, um, there was, uh, and let me show you this next. So I, I asked if um, I could go make a visit and Gary had this uh, piece from um, Carmel Highlands that you see now. So you see the front side, you see all the tar on the flip side. And let's go to the next one. And I have kind of a long thing to let you know here, fill in the blanks, but there's uh, there was this one additional informing element for me to the story that came from a Watsonville site, Santa Cruz 44. There were several burials encountered during construction here and during the removal, one of the items that was documented was this very tiny steatite item shaped roughly similar to the large kind of so-called ear spools. And this is what was so cool. It was decorated on one end with abalone. Um, I mean, when they found it, of course, much of the abalone had broken off or worn off, but there's still a significant amount of it in place. And you can see, you know, I believe that there was tar. So since it was a burial associated item, it was of course reburied with the remains, but it turns out that Gary had had a replica model made of it which I was able to see when I went to photograph and study the other two pieces from Carmel Valley and the Highlands. So these three pieces of evidence made me feel pretty comfortable in my decision to replicate the Eshelot spools or spool singular with um, abalone ornaments, ornaments in the form of a pear. So, you know, in my experience, archeologists um, had referred to these as ear spools and not that I know a lot, a lot, a lot about them, but I made the assumption, this is for the ears. We have two ears, therefore they come in pairs. And so for this reason, I ended up making a pair, but I got to wondering later, wait a minute, like why for, I've actually seen quite a few, not a huge number, but not just one or two, um, even just from the, this Monterey area. <clears throat> and I got to thinking, well, I've never seen two that match. And yes, some of them were surface finds, but even this one that we're looking at, which came from a burial, um, only had one this one, there was not a matching piece. So um, at the time, I, 
I know I kind of asked a few archaeologist friends, I think Ray Schwaderer, um, Rob Edwards, I remember asking Rob at his birthday party, and Mark Hilkema, <clears throat> if they remembered or knew of any matching pairs, and no one did. So now I was questioning the whole idea of pairs, but too late, I already made two. Anyway, to top it off, this is what was so surprising and kind of amazing. Um, at the same time I was making these pieces, these two quote unquote ear spools, um, I was pumping gas one day and there was a young man who was doing the same right across from me. And he, I saw that he had an ear spool in his earlobe. So, um, you know, I, I assumed that there was one in the other ear, but I could only see one from my angle. And I asked him if he minded a couple of questions. And he was really happy to tell me about it. And what was so cool is he said, um, he told me that he was reviving an old time family tradition from Mexico. And yes, they only wear one. And that they always had only been one. So I was really blown away by that. And I really can't say at this point, you know, what that might mean for traditions here in California, but it's still got me wondering. And uh, if anyone out there has ever has any insights to share on this, I'm really hoping you'll track me down and let me know. Okay, my personal plugs. Anyway, so just a few quick pictures of some of the progression of cutting and shaping the stone, which is very soft, very easy to work with, but um, basically a word of caution in case you ever decide to do it, work with it, just be very careful because I had gone through all of this work and was really had it all shaped and I was standing in my garage on a concrete floor and I dropped one of them. And luckily the whole thing didn't shatter but um it you know i i it did mash on one edge and then i just wanted to point out in the lower whoops lower right i heated up um um tar and pitch combination and you know was put it on the surface of the steatite piece to um basically glue the abalone piece in place. And what really surprised me about that was how quickly the asphalt um, cooled. And as soon as it cools down, even just a little bit, it, it hardens and it's, you can no longer use it as, as an adhesive. So even though I was just like a few, you know, couple little inches away, it would cool. So after I had that happen a few times, I had to like, really hustle and get that stuff in place. Anyway, so here we have um, a, another steatite spool upper left. Um, that's also from Eshelot village, but that was a surface find. Um, interesting, an abalone shell with asphalt contents that Gary Bruschini um, shared the photo with me um, at the time, couldn't remember where it had come from. And then uh, two shots of a, of a piece from Redwood City, Philoli. And then a drawing that I did basically showing how we assume that they were worn. Anyway, so another story. This one involves Ray Schwaderer. Oh, it's getting late. So um, this kind of a reverse order experience beginning with me cutting abalone shell one day um, the shell was big, proportionately thick walls. And while I was cutting it, a really beautiful um, thin section delaminated off of the main piece. And um, when I checked it, it was super strong. So I just decided to make two matching pendants for a pair of earrings. Anyway, um, and then because I love incised abalone ornaments, I ended up incising them, put them in my ears, really loved them. They were really lightweight. And they basically be, you know, became my go-to earrings that I basically just put in every day. So fast forward many, many months, maybe even a couple of years, I was with uh, fellow Rumson, uh, Louis Trevino. 
and then state park archaeologist for Monterey District, Ray Schwader, who's with us tonight. Um, we were standing on the Hudson Mound, Monterey 12, at our ancient village site of Ishenta. And these earrings, you know, were in my ears because every day I had them on. And that day was no exception. Ray had promised to bring us a copy of a talk she had given at an SCA conference a few years earlier about this very site, Monterey 12. She handed over the stapled sheets and Lewis and I kind of flipped through them briefly just to get an idea of what was in our hands. There were a few pages of artifact photos, but one caught our attention it was a group of five incised abalone pendants. It was so common for me to be wearing those earrings, I didn't really make the connection until Lewis made a point of looking at my earrings, looking back at the sheets, and um, there, um, sorry. <laughs> And he kept looking and looking back at the picture, looking at my earrings, looking at the picture. And we both realized in that, in that moment that my earrings were so similar to one of the ornaments um, in her report. And we exchanged like this magical moment that I really don't know how to describe, but there was something um, beautifully eerie, I guess I would say about it. It was such a strong sense of connection to the place we were actually standing, like a connection through time. And particularly meaningful to me because it wasn't planned and it was not contrived that everything had happened so organically. Here's a close up picture, but I actually think that these are replicas. But at one time I know for a fact that the originals were there and I must say, thank you, Ray Schwaderer, for insisting that the original pieces should not be on display because they may have been burial associated. You held strong in your commitment, even though it meant being extremely unpopular with the Point Lobos Foundation at the time. And I really want to publicly thank you for being such a kind and valued ally to all of us over the years for your unwavering support, yes, I wrote this in advance, of native inclusion and for your respect and protection of our cultural sites. You truly are a treasure. And I really mean that. Oh my, time's flying. Um, I call this last section inspiration. Okay, we don't have too many more. Because the flow of knowledge and learning and inspiration travels kind of like rivers and streams, coming from different places and directions, sometimes diverging, sometimes converging, sometimes unassuming and other times demanding our attention. And we all have the potential to contribute to that flow. In this particular case, it has the ability to bring pride and beauty and cultural identity to families and communities that lost so much. So I think I can be pretty quickly about quick about this. You saw this earlier, basketry ear ornaments from the um, Kai Brownlee Museum. Oh no, from the British Museum. And um, I just wanted to include the fact that those pieces inspired me to make a pair myself. And um, it was quite a while before I got around to it, but what I especially wanted to tell you has to do with the incised bone tubes that are on the end that goes behind the ear because I incised those bones and actually kind of used some bird bone tubes that as inspiration that have come out of sites in the Monterey Bay area. Um, but what I wanted to tell about this one is that I, um, let's see if I wrote it down, I can say it more quickly, that I rubbed into the, those incised patterned lines um, some burnt redwood charcoal that I found um, near a cultural site that had been burnt in the Soberanus fire in 2016. And it's just that 
there was a lot that 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 added to these your ornaments that it was more than just making a thing but that the the charcoal powder actually came from this ancient site and that it was part of this event this traumatic event that happened in 2016 and I'm still trying to figure out how to keep these beautiful ear ornaments in place when they're worn, since I've not run across anything written about them. Just this and two other renderings of native Monterey women that were drawn in the late 1700s do depict them wearing these type of ear ornaments. And um, I'm gonna skip through these just showing that you know, we've, I've made working baskets also. And these baskets have ended up being used by us. In this case, these are my cousins, Violet and Linda Smith at the left and Linda's sister, Violet's aunt Cindy at the right. And I just love, and I kind of marvel at times. I remember we were all gathering Manzanita berries that day and I just, I thought this is kind of a miracle of sorts because a few years ago, there were supposedly no Ohlone baskets left in the world. And then we found there were these older ones. And now as a community, we're actually using them to do cultural things again, which I call a cool thing. Anyway, I'm gonna skip through this, get to the end. But I think you can see that you know, there's the inspiration from um, pendants that we see. Craig Bates, who's with us um, this evening, and I made this um, based upon, I'll just give you a chance to skim through that really quickly. It's self-explanatory. Um, but inspiration comes from different places, right? Um, gonna have to skip through that. And even it occurred to me that this mural, which is also behind me, this evening, you know, if not for all that I've learned through decades of study and experiences with ethnographic and archaeological sources, um, museum collections and sharing of information between myself and others, I really wouldn't be able to populate my own artwork with accurate imagery of the past. And I wouldn't be able to collaborate with other artists who are interpreting the world of our ancestors. Like, because of the things I've learned, through sources like archaeology, for example, I'm able to influence the way our ancestors are portrayed in this modern world, and that they can be honored by not oversimplifying them in old and tired, you know, stereotypes. So almost last slide. Making these things is not just for purposes of replicating objects of the past, but to put them to use again in the world, to make them part of a living culture, not just relics of the past, and to revitalize these old technologies so that the practices can continue into the future. So I want to say shururu, thank you. Thank you to all of you who've contributed to this effort. It means a lot to us in Native communities to get deeper insights into our past. Thank you, that's it. Oh, Bali Kamalish. Um, I see that it's a minute after eight. I just wanna say <laughs> wonderful, thank you very much. No, no apologies necessary. Um, I just wanna say we have a film fest next month in October. California Archaeology Month, and I want to just see if there are any questions from the audience before we close out this evening's event. Um, so beautiful. Thank you very much, Linda. Yes. You're welcome. Um, you can type your questions in the chat, or um, maybe that's the best way to proceed. I see that Greg Castro posted a suggestion for laser interferometry for scanning the um, Tar attached to the ground uh, stone okay. tool there. How can I preserve? I mean, I'll keep a record of. <clears throat> maybe I'll um, just take screenshots. Well, it's 
we're recorded now, so it's it recorded for per in perfect. But, but I'll be able to see the comments. Oh, um, I'll jot it down and send it to you. I don't, uh, sorry, I don't know the answer. I'll, I'm gonna just take screenshots. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, sorry, any questions from the group here? Um, from Jane Stillinger, um, do you know how some of the baskets ended up in foreign countries, in the museums of uh, foreign countries? Yes, um, in the late, um, I don't know, about late 1700s, um, early to mid to even little uh, mid probably, 1800s, um, foreign visitors who came ended up um, acquiring them. I do not know exactly how. Um, some people might like to say they were stolen. Um, I don't know if we knew all the details, we might you know, reach that conclusion, but um, I more suspect that they were traded in some way, just you know, from other contextual things that um, I've read and, um, but in any case, they were considered uh, very kind of exotic things. Uh, like we get, um, we buy um, mementos, you know, of trips to remind us of things. And in those days, there wasn't a lot going on in terms of um, entertainment. So in Europe, people who, uh, men who worked on um, ships and traveled to distant lands often brought these curiosities home and they had special cabinets built um, that they displayed these in in their homes and people would come you know, for a, a get together and that was part of their entertainment for the evening and there was you know, to see and hear about these distant places and look at these wonderful things that um, had been brought back that they'd never seen before. And those private collections eventually became the uh, beginnings of many museums in Europe, in Germany in particular. Um, thank you. Uh, Doug has a question. Um, He's um, blown away by the investment and in time to make a basket and um, they must have been very valuable to the community. And uh, I wonder if you have a comment, says Doug. Well, they certainly do take, you know, so much, I mean, almost unbelievable amount of time, even when I make them myself and I it's only my recollections afterwards, you know, once they're finished, it's almost hard even for me to remember, to realize truly what an effort it was because there's a lot of suffering that happens doing this kind of work. But, you know, it kind of gets lost in the memory, sort of like childbirth, you know, <laughs> the memory fades. Um, but what reminds me just are, the uncomfortable times and so those kind of stand out as um, and then I also you know keep records now of my processes and I keep track of my hours and that sort of thing and my processes to remind me in the future or when I'm long gone maybe someone will learn from those little notebooks of mine but um, you uh, let me look at your question again just so that um, I can remind myself you asked me Oh, but that they must have been very valuable. I'm certain that they were. Um, and yet at the same time, um, they were not rare like they are now. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think we have to kind of balance that um, perspective, but they were extraordinarily, um, um, beautiful in their decoration, specifically because they were for special occasions. Um, we don't know a lot about that, but they were um, ceremonial. 
which doesn't necessarily always mean like in a religious sense, but certainly um, like bringing out your best, not that in, most people probably have fine china anymore, but you get the idea that you are going to honor special guests, you are going to respect and honor certain special occasions or offer, you know, this um, unusual fine gift perhaps, um, you know, to the leader of another uh, group or I don't really know. I mean, I'm, I don't have documentation for this is for here. So um, I'm offering just my best guesses on it, but certainly they were, very valuable in the past but because there were a lot of weavers and weaving was an everyday occurrence I'm going to assume that it wouldn't be considered obviously such a rarity as it is for us today because I have read um, descriptions in the Bay Area um, in 1775 when the first Spanish ship went in to um, chart the the bay that there were baskets that sound basically like this or very fancy feathered baskets that men brought out and offered um, foods in to the Spanish that and the priest you know the Spanish who had come so um, I assume in that sense who knows if the Spanish thought you were giving it to them what if they took it away you know i think that if the native people had been that concerned about it they probably would not have offered the food in that but maybe would have chosen something else um so that's the thing that kind of makes me feel that it's a little bit different than i would today would not take it out with me in a tule boat for example i would not load it up with seeds you know with um Pinole with um, parched seeds and things like that, or little seed cakes. I would very fussy with it, but um, you know, hopefully that just gives you a little bit of insights. But truthfully, I don't know all the answers to that. Uh, thank you, uh, Christopher has a question. He has his hand raised. Thank you, Christopher. Do you want to ask your question? How much of the the time you spent making the baskets do you think was put into decorating them like say if you were to just make a bare minimum basket with no decorations how long do you think it would take you you're going to be disappointed in my answer christopher because um it really depends i mean my answer could be so different depending on the size of the basket, um, I assume you probably do mean a coiled basket. Um, and if it's finely stitched like this, um, but, and, but obviously the size of it, um, the technique of weaving, I mean, you know, the weaving itself, which is very slow sometimes, depending, um, probably takes less time than uh, acquiring and preparing all of the materials. So in the end, I'm sorry, I can't really answer your question, but I think you're wondering if you didn't have to make beads and attach beads and put in little feathers. I can definitely tell you that um, the time reduces by a lot because let me just try to think for a moment. Like in the time I spend fiddling around trying to get the feather sitting in the proper position in the stitch, um, I could probably have done five stitches, you know, if that helps a little. I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of guessing. Sure. Yeah. That answers my question. Yeah, it helps a little, yeah. Okay. Um, how, Linda, do you have time for a couple more questions? I do, yes. Um, and I think the question of value that you were uh, speaking to earlier might connect to this um, question um, about, uh, or it's a question from Stan Rushworth. Do you have any young students who you're mentoring at this moment? I do not. 
and um, there's a person who was in one of the photos who's a young person um, who would like to learn but is um, very busy with her job these days in life. So um, it really hasn't happened. And that seems to be pretty much how it's been over the years, whether the person was younger or roughly my age range. But, um, and I, there's another young woman who probably is not on with us tonight. I didn't see her name, but she could be, um, would be a wonderful candidate for it, but she's expecting a baby um, at the end of the year. So I think she's gonna be pretty busy. And at the for the time being, she lives pretty far away. But I know that when she's able, she'll, you know, come to um, begin learning. And so, I'm, I'm thinking maybe the solution, I mean, some of it you just can't do, you know, by Zoom meetings, but, but there's a lot that we've learned that there's a lot you can share. And now that we have Zoom abilities for that matter, you know, you can actually have the camera on you and we can probably share those things those ways. And um, so I'm, hoping that things that I've documented already, which have mostly been photographic and probably not enough video, will be helpful to other people. But I think I should start, um, if I ever have time, I don't have any time. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's kind of now or never at my age. So um, time's running short here. And um, I would like to start doing some little short videos that really show um, some of these processes. That's, I guess, those are my ideas for what to do in lieu of people, you know, being here and nearby to be able to, for it to be practical um, process. And the, this would connect to this last question. Uh, okay. How do you drill the holes in those shell beads? Um, seems like that's a oh. thing a video could be. Well, used. believe me, I don't do it with, <laughs> I don't do it with a little hand drill. <laughs> no, you know, it's called the Dremel or other, or other brands of similar tool. Um, just with a little, a small uh, diamond drill bit works very well. Of course, you have to make sure that you do not allow yourself to breathe any of the shell dust because it'll destroy your lungs and eventually probably kill you. So, um, yeah, I found ways to, I mean, you use water to mitigate that dust. And, um, you know, you can, I just set a piece of wood with my bead on it. I actually uh, carved out a little depression that would fit most of my beads. So it wouldn't, you know, flip out of my hands and fly across in and lost under the, under the willow trees, which happened many times. And I did a lot of cussing after all that work, they'd go, you know, and I of course could never find them again. Um, but yeah, so I made this little jig so I could set them in there and then, um, set that down in a in a container of water. So there's just a little bit of water covering it. So as the um, shell dust was created with the drilling, the water carries it. And then you need to be very careful about where you dispose of that water mm -hmm. so that the water evaporates, the, the dust becomes airborne again when the wind blows. Um, you don't want it all concentrated someplace where you're going to end up breathing it after all. And then um, the other thing you can do is um, use a suction. And I saw that there were these very expensive uh, contraptions that you could buy, but they were industrial strength and industrial sized and industrial priced. Um, they were called um, dust um, whatevers. And um, so I just was lucky to find a little vacuum cleaner 
at a secondhand store, thrift shop. And um, it's turned out to be great because it has a cotton um, dust receptacle bag inside. And so I just rigged that up on my table where I was working so it would be at a comfortable height. And as I drilled the outside rims, um, I still wore masks and things. And, um, but as I drilled, then the vacuum cleaner was running and it would suction the, the dust, I presume most of it, um, into the vacuum cleaner. And then I would dispose of that in a wet, you know, in a wet manner, in a bucket of water and um, <clears throat> the same thing. Protection. Excellent. Um, it seems like Rob, you had a question about the, the mural. I was trying to make the connection to the conversation, but maybe I missed it. Do you want to explain yourself or should we call it an evening? Rob Edwards. <laughs> oh, I know what he means. Oh. Oh, there's an amazing. The Oakland Museum. Oh, the yeah. Oakland Mural. Not Museum. The Oakland Mural. Do you want me to mention that? Okay. Yes. Um, there's an amazing <laughs> mural mosaic created by a mosaic artist Suzanne Takahara that went up, um, whatever, a few months ago. Um, late last year, I believe, right at the end of the year or beginning of this year in East Oakland. And it's on the building. If you want to look it up, I couldn't really figure out a way to include it this evening in this talk in an archaeological context. But um, anyway, um, you can look at East Side Arts Alliance in Oakland. You can East Side Arts Alliance website. And it is actually on the the wall of the same building that they are in, but it's the wall right around the corner. But if you locate that, I know Rob and Julia went to see it, right? Yeah, and it's, it's like 12 feet tall by 10 feet wide. It is so absolutely amazingly beautiful. Um, if you're ever in the area, you really, you really must see it, yeah. Um, I am inspired, um, grateful for your presentation this evening, Linda. Um, you really brought a lot of warmth and uh, happiness to the otherwise pretty rough summer. Um, I'm very grateful again, and um, I think I'm going to close things out and just uh, say thank you to everyone for tuning in this evening. Um, uh, for our first uh, SCAS presentation of the new year. And uh, please uh, stay in touch. Uh, look for our upcoming events uh, once a month. Uh, again, we'll have a, a meeting next, next month in uh, October. We'll have a little film fest, which will be fun. And uh, otherwise, I think uh, safe travels and have a good evening. So okay. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. So what? Do what? Say that chat again. That'll be the whole thing. Oh. And Linda, I just saved the chat. Oh, did she go? <laughs> <clears throat> Good night, everyone. <laughs>